Good afternoon. It's already past 12. Now, I've been asked to convince all of you that obstetric airway is associated with some risk. If you agree with me and say yes, actually the lecture is done. But if you don't agree, then of course I have to convince you that obstetric airway is really something which you need to pay attention. Now, is the risk increased during, you know, I mean, in obstetrics, say for a cesarean section intubation? The answer is yes. Even if you don't believe the airway issue here, just the physiology of pregnancy itself will point to these important features here. The FRC is decreased. The oxygen consumption is increased. Therefore, the apneic time for intubation it's, is decreased compared to a non-pregnant subject. That itself is a red flag for us that obstetric anesthesia has an inherent problem of that if there is a difficulty in intubation, the patient can likely to become hypoxic much quicker. Now, but after doing a little bit of research into this, there are certain intriguing factors in the obstetric airway and physiology that really increase the risk of obstetric anesthesia. This is an example here. The platelet count was 42,000, and therefore epidural was not provided. There was a fetal bradycardia. The airway was class 2, and they embarked on a general anesthesia, which is normally the case and they could not intubate this patient, an LMA was inserted, fetal heart rate normalized, and they reverted the case, uh, I mean, they woke up the patient and, went, uh, and then did a fiber optic intubation. Now, if you quantify the risk of difficult intubation in obstetrics, the generally quoted figures is roughly one in 300. And these papers were published in mid-1980s. But then, in recently, this was re-evaluated in England, and they still came up with the same figure of 1 in 238. The indications remained the same as before. But in 88% of the patients, there was a good preoperative examination or evaluation. However, some people did not follow the protocol. Therefore, they blamed the anesthesiologist for not following the protocol. But the point I'm making here is the obstetric intubation, the relative risk has not changed in spite of several decades. And why is this? And also one more thing, there is a variation in the, in the obstetric intubations. There are studies that says one in 750, there are studies that says it's one in 1500. And I put a study here which is one in 16, and actually that comes from our institution. You know, we had a fair number of difficult intubations, and the reason is we do a very low number of GAs in a very high risk patients and probably that may be the cause. Now, this is the normal scenario for a general anesthesia. The fetal heart rate is low, the patient is brought in and you know the anesthesiologist asks how is the airway and we begin to go. So this brings three important issues, that scenario. One is a hastiness, an experience and, of course, the position of the patients. Majority of the times, because there is this a haste, we actually forget to position the patient. And inadequate position leads, actually, a, a simple intubation becomes difficult and a difficult intubation becomes impossible. And this is a standard quotation which I tell every resident that goes to obstetric anesthesia or even for any general anesthesia. And this is the figure, actually, that shows that although the cesarean section is going up, the incidence of general anesthesia for these sections is actually going down. And that leads to the second point here is that there is a diminished use of regional anesthesia. And therefore, the experience is, you know, becomes limited. This is something which people have not evaluated. Multiracial society. See, if you are practicing in one part of a globe. You get used to their airways, you get used to their beards, they get used to their mustaches. But if you work in a multiracial society, particularly in the United States where there's a lot of immigrants, you come across different kinds of patients every day. So therefore, there is the risk 
that comes from the racial origin of the patient. Then the three important things which I want to concentrate is there are certain anatomical and physiological factors that are associated with pregnancy and labor that makes the intubation difficult and increases the risk. If this patient actually came for a cesarean section, I say the risk is low. You know why? Because we would call everyone in the hospital to give a hand. What is the best plan? How to secure the airway? But unfortunately in obstetrics, you are alone, the patient apparently looks normal with subtle changes and you don't recognize them and we get into trouble. That is why you have to critically assess the airway. If I ask a question, are there any bony changes during pregnancy? The answer is no, there are no bony changes. In fact, the joints are lax, so the intubation should be easy, but unfortunately it is not so. So therefore, the changes during pregnancy and labor has to be in the mucosa that is lining the airways. I did this study in 1997 when I was in Barbados where we have done 6,000 C-sections under GA, 99% incidence of, of GA rate there. And what I found, the incidence of class 4 airway is actually higher compared to non-pregnant patients. So, therefore, the class 4 incidence is high compared to non-pregnant patients. That is an important finding. In the British Journal of Anesthesia, they did a linear study. They followed the same group of patients at 12 weeks of gestation, 38 weeks of gestation, and they found that the class 4 airway increased by 34%. And there was a correlation between the airway class and the body weight gain. So most likely it is the fluid retention that produced those changes. Now, there was a small case report in the Canadian Journal where the anesthesiologist examined the patient when she came in for labor and delivery. The airway was class two or one, but when they called for cesarean section, the airway was class three and four. So some changes occurred during the course of the labor. And myself and my colleagues actually evaluated this further and published as a paper. What we did, we actually looked at the airways, photographed the airways at the beginning of the labor and at the end of the labor, and what we found, that the airway changed by 33% by one class following the labor, and 5% of the airways changed by two, two classes, say from class one to class three or class two to class four, and there were eight parturians at the end of the labor with class four airways when we omitted every patient with class four airway from this study at the beginning of the label. And this is just to show you in the form of a table. And this is actually a picture of that. As you can see how the airway is different from the pre-labor to the post-labor. And this is following 48 hours. What I'm trying to convince you is labor actually changes the airway of the patients. Now, you may argue that it is a subjective study. You know, you know which is prepartum, which is postpartum, and therefore you can manipulate the study. So in order to obviate that, we actually went a little further. We used what is called as acoustic reflectometry and mapped out the airway pre-labor and post-labor. And this is a simple graph you get when you send the sound waves inside the airway and then record them. And what we found the oral airway, which is the, what you can see, which is the malampartic class, the oral airway decreased by 5 ml, and the pharyngeal airway, which you don't see, and makes intubation difficult if it gets narrowed, changes, decreases by 5 ml. So there is a 10 ml decrease in the total upper volume airway. There was no correlation with any factors like age or you know, weight gain in pregnancy. However, the first stage of the labor did correlate in the second study, or at least reaching to the point of you know, significance, but didn't reach. Now, the question comes is, did anyone replicate our findings? And the answer is yes. And I was delighted when this paper was published last year in, in British Journal of Anesthesia, where they replicated the study in pregnancy and during labor. And what they found is the incidence of class four airway actually increases at the end of the 15 minutes postpartum. So this really proves the point that pregnant airways change and they are dynamically changed during labor. Now how does this change in airway translate into a risk? Is it a high risk or a low risk? 
And this is one of the largest studies published in 1990s from South Africa, where they correlated the standard malampati class with the ease or difficulty in intubation. And what they found is that as the class, airway class increases, the intubation becomes relatively difficult. And as you can see, a class four airway poses 11.3 times difficulty as compared to class one airway. And of course, they also looked at the other features that can increase the, your risk of difficult intubation. And if you have a combination, then it makes it worse. So therefore, the take home message is, the pregnancy and labor increases the airway class and the relative risk of difficult intubation increases. Obesity, as we know, is associated with a difficult intubation from the retrospective studies data collection. And therefore, there's no argument here. And even a retrospective study published from Michigan, where they evaluated the maternal morbidity and mortality, six out of the eight patients who died were obese. So that is something which you have to always keep in mind. So what is the significant implication of this finding? Is always check the airway before you start your cesarean section. Do not simply go back to the record and say, OK, the airway was fine. And always look for any other risk factors. Because if you, ha if you have more than two risk factors, your intubation difficulty becomes more. A recent finding is, suppose if you, if you ask yourself, is the risk of difficult intubation, or if the induction risk is more, or the extubation risk is more? The answer actually is, it is at extubation. Recent data you know, from Michigan, as well as the CMAC data suggest that none of the patients actually died at induction. We got really better because we are actually focusing at induction. It is at extubation because we think once the tube is in, it is all done. But it is the extubation that has posed problems, and these patients actually died at extubation because there was a respiratory issues and they could not reintubate these patients. This is just a few examples from the CMAC. Why is it? Why is the risk of extubation or the risk of reintubation following extubation is difficult? The answer to that actually lies in the editorial you know, that was written on our paper. What it says is there is a relationship. This is a very important point I'm making here. There is a relationship between functional residual capacity and the pharyngeal volume, which you do not see. It is the volume between the glottis and the uvula. If the functional residual capacity decreases, this study is from Japan, if the functional residual capacity decreases, the pharyngeal volume decreases. Now, what happens following general anesthesia? The FRC decreases. What happens when you don't position these patients well on the table? The FRC decreases. If you have the patient propped up, it is much better than having the patient completely flat on the table because the FRC decreases there. And therefore, you have to keep these points in mind that there is always a relationship between the functional residual capacity and the pharyngeal volume. And therefore, it, it could pose a problem at extubation in these patients. Actually, this finding has changed my practice. I am critically always tell the residents, please call me for extubation. For bariatric patients, when we prop up the patients for intubation, when I have to extubate those patients, I actually put the ramp meticulously back again because if there is a problem or respiratory issues, it is difficult to intubate when they are flat. What about preeclampsia? We all know that just now you heard, you know, I mean, one and a half hour lectures on preeclampsia. There's a fluid retention edema. Actually, they did some studies on that. One study showed that the hyperresponsiveness is increased in the preeclampsia. There is metacolin study actually. A second one, they used the same airway acoustics which we used in preeclamptic patients, and what they found that the airway volume is decreased in the preeclamptic patients compared to the non-pregnant patients, and there was a difference in the supine and sitting positions also. In the sitting positions, the volumes were lower. So preeclampsia, which is a complication of normal pregnancy, and if they are in labor, probably the risk of intubating them may be more, although we don't have a very concrete data proving this point. This is just to show you the failed intubation. Airway looked okay, it's not that bad, 
But when you critically evaluate the neck of this patient, look at this picture here. And this picture actually she has got a receding chin and it is more or less, you know, straight line here. And this should have given a red flag saying that intubation could be difficult. But when this patient came, this was an ITP patient as I said, came for, for splenectomy. It was, we just propped up the patient and it was a grade one you know, view on intubation. But however it could be that because the experience of the anesthesiologist was similar in both situations, it's likely that the pregnancy and labor could have changed her airway and increased the risk of difficult intubation in that case or inability to intubate the patient. So in conclusion, yes, the risk is increased. And if there is a human element of examining the airway or intubating them, maybe we have to actually move on to a, a, a robotic intubation. You know, this is actually just shows that how a robot can be used in cases of I mean, intubation because you don't see them well, whereas a robot can go inside and actually put the tube. That may be the future, I don't know the answer, but I just want to, uh, you know, to tell you that this is the, the future direction of intubation. Thank you very much.